here. Uh, good morning. I'm Curtis Burnback. I'm the President and Chief Technology Officer of Advanced Fusion Systems. Uh, before I start, I would just like to uh, make a quick comment on the last panel. Um, listen to what these men said. What Dr. Rutledge, who I don't know, said about it can happen at any moment is 120 percent correct. And the points that Gail, who I have known for many years, made about harmonics and the problems of harmonics and the inattention of the utilities to the critical nature of the harmonic problem uh, is also a huge, huge issue, and I applaud you for bringing that forward and making everybody aware of that. So, okay, a little better. Okay, so some of you know me, and for those of you who do know me, what I'm going to say is not going to surprise you. For those of you who don't know me, I want to say the following. You've probably all heard all manner of statements about the family of electromagnetic threats to the power grid. What you may not realize is that some of these statements are untrue and others self-serving. It is my intention today to set this record straight. This may have the effect of causing some of you to dislike me. So be it. You won't be the first. There are also various export laws that prevent me from disclosing some critical material because there may or may not be non-U.S. citizens in the office, uh, in the audience. To you, I apologize, but I am constrained by some very severe laws which in most cases both of our nations have signed and we are all bound by them. That said, there are three basic types of electromagnetic threats. Solar coronal mass ejections, nuclear EMP, and non-nuclear EMP, which is also sometimes referred to as IEMI. Um, let me just uh, see if I can make this thing cooperate. Okay, one more. There we go, okay. So, to go a little further on what Dr. Rutledge said about the history of the Earth and the Sun. About four and a half billion years ago, the Earth and the Sun began their dance. Sometime later, specifically August of 1859, there was a massive solar storm which ejected a large plasma ball aimed more or less directly at Earth. The effect on the nascent power system and the telegraph system was immediate and dramatic. Northern lights lit the skies almost in the entire northern hemisphere. Since then, there have been several more solar events that have affected the power grid and a number of significant near misses. We've been studying these effects, but I think it's important to realize that it's naive to think that in the prior 4.5 billion years, there were no solar storms and they've only been around in the last 100 or 150 years. Unfortunately, there are vested interests that tell us that solar storms can be modeled by a 100-year model. And mathematically, this is totally untenable. And this little graphic I have prepared here uh, explains this. On the top line, we have the creation of the Earth running out four and a half billion years. That last line represents a one million year period. This line over here, okay? The second line spreads out one million years, and the last line now represents 1,000 years. The bottom line takes 1,000 years and shows us that from this whole huge amount of data, this is how much real data we have. And there is no mathematics around that can validly say that a sample of on the order of 3 times 10 to the minus 6th all at the far right end of the graph can be used as a valid method of analyzing and modeling solar storms. It is pure garbage. Now, this is a problem. The New York, let's look at some comparisons. Uh, let me get this off. Okay. The New York, New York, Jersey area was recently devastated by Hurricane Sandy just one year after Hurricane Irene devastated the same region. We were told that Irene was a 100-year storm. So what was Sandy? Where did she come from? 
Our statistical analysis for so hurricanes is about the same database as solar storms. Now, there's another interesting fact. Let's talk about the U.S. Constitution, the piece of paper down the street, not the ship. Back to our chart. Congress has mandated that the U.S. Constitution be protected against a 500-year event, shown in yellow on the same chart. Now, what this says is that a physical piece of paper which has absolutely no value in protecting the lives and the economy of this country is to be afforded five times better protection than the power grid. How many people will die if the original copy of the Constitution is destroyed? How many people will starve or die due to the loss of food, medications, life support, water, sewage, if we look at solar storms? Yet NERC, FERC, and other cognizant parties with vested interests are betting all of our lives and the lives of our children and our children's children on this. It is an outrage. Now, to go one step further, the good folks at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who we all know is a very responsible section of the government, recently came out and said that solar storms should be treated on either a 500 or 1,000 year worst case scenario. So what is it that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission knows that the power industry doesn't? And that NERC and FERC think it's 100 years is fine for coal plants, but NERC, uh, uh, the NRC thinks 1,000 years is appropriate for nuclear plants. I will also point out that nuclear plants are the only plants that are required to report solar storm events and damage to their facilities from GIC. We have tried desperately to get the information that is held up in NERC, in FERC, at EPRI, and other places, information which is public, which these organizations have claimed is classified, yet they have absolutely no legal right or mandate to classify this information. They are not the Department of Defense. They are not the Department of Homeland Security. They are a bunch of intergovernmental or non-governmental organizations. Yet another outrage. Solar storms. Um, the Congressional EMP Commission identified about 600 critical nodes on the grid which must be protected. The actual number is somewhat larger, but this gives us an idea of the scale. Uh, John Kappenman, who unfortunately is not here today, uh, is perhaps the most knowledgeable person around on the subject of the effects of solar storms on the grid. Having worked on this for over 15 years, being the developer of the neutral blocking concept in 1990 under a contract with EPRI. And he has estimated that a minimum realistic cost of grid protection just against solar storms is about four to five billion dollars. And this comes back to the number that uh, Andrea Boland mentioned of uh, 25 or 30 cents per person per year over a five, amortized over a five year period. So, this is an interesting concept because anybody can afford 25 or 30 cents a year. I mean, that's just not a realistic premise to think that we can't afford to do this. The concept of neutral blocking, well, John and I are good friends, but as scientists, we've agreed to disagree on this. Uh, I don't believe neutral blocking is a viable concept because at a point, neutral blocking falls apart. It's a fairly detailed technical discussion, and I'll be glad to uh, have that conversation offline. It's not really the specific topic of this conference. Um, but any implementation of protection at all by any system, no matter how effective it is, is better than none. However, we need to be careful because if we only partially implement, if, for example, Maine and Virginia are leaders and they implement GIC protection on their grids, we have what we call the whack-a-mole effect. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The mole pops up, you hit it, it pops up over here, you hit it here, it pops up somewhere else. GIC is exactly like this. And solar storm protection is really only practical if it is applied on a nationwide or more correctly continental basis because 
it's just too, too wide an issue and you can't have, you can't take the energy that wants to pop up here. It's, it's got to go somewhere. So it's going to go somewhere else and that has to be dealt with. Uh, some people have referred to protecting against solar storms as EMP protection. Uh, this is grossly misleading. Um, there, it is true that solar storms uh, are very similar in their end result to the E3 portion of a nuclear explosion and the EMP waveform that results from it, uh, but it is not EMP in the classical sense. EMP in the classical sense includes the E1 portion, which is this uh, initial very, very fast rise time, very high transient, uh, that is highly destructive in and of itself. Advanced Fusion Systems, our, my company, has patented both domestically and internationally a protective system known as the field collapse method, which when used in conjunction with its integrated neutral blocking capabilities is capable of providing 100% blocking against the largest conceivable surges from any E1, E2, or E3 source. Now, let's take a look at what the largest surge is. Astrophysicists at the University of California have been studying stars uh, of the same class as our sun. They have observed coronal mass ejections as big as 10,000 times the size of the Carrington event. Should such an event hit Earth square on, or even as a glancing blow, and particularly if the fields of the uh, CME cloud and the Earth's magnetic field are aligned, well, at that point, uh, the atmosphere lights up like a neon lamp and we all die. There have been several mass extinctions that are unexplained, and while I can't offer any proof that they are due to seat large CMEs, uh, similarly, no one can offer any proof that they're not. This is opposed to other ones like the KT event and things like that where it's very clear what caused <laughs> extinctions. Uh, and so this gets me back once more to the 100-year model problem. Do we want to bet our future, our lives and our futures on a mathematical model which is so specious? Let's talk about nuclear EMP for a while. World War II and the Manhattan Project brought us another class of electromagnetic threat, the electromagnetic pulse. It has been known since 1925 when the noted physicist Arthur Compton postulated that firing a stream of highly energetic photons and electrons into atoms that have a low atomic number caused them to eject a stream of electrons which in turn gives rise to a unique class of electromagnetic wave, one with unprecedented ability to damage electrical and electronic devices and systems. Earlier nuclear testing gave hints of the capability and the extent of the EMP problem. But the technology that was in use at the time, and I'm now talking about 1945 through, say, 1965, uh, was vacuum tubes, electromechanical relays, mechanical switches. And these are very hard technologies. They're almost impossible to destroy. In fact, in the mid-1990s, the US intelligence intelligence community got hold of a few Russian fighters and were very surprised to find vacuum tubes in their electronics. And everybody said, oh, ha, 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 the Russians are so primitive. The Russians weren't primitive, they were smart. They were smart as foxes because they knew that vacuum tubes in radar in an aircraft in a fighter plane are totally immune to EMP. Uh, it was not really appreciated until 1962 when the US conducted a series of high altitude tests codenamed Fishbowl where uh, hydrogen bombs were set off over Kwajalein Island. The detonations caused bursts of gamma rays, which interacted with the oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, which in turn released electrons that uh, produced an electromagnetic pulse that spread for thousands of miles. Thousands of miles. EMP knows no political boundaries. As a result of this, Street lights in Hawaii were blown out. Radio navigation and communication was disrupted for 18 hours as far away as Australia. Now, we're talking about distances of thousands, well, 900 miles from a Kwajalein to Hawaii and 18 or 1900 to Australia. So, what can we do to protect this? 
A realistic cost estimate for EMP protection on a nationwide scale, and this again goes back to the work of the EMP Commission uh, and the 600 or so critical nodes, is somewhere between 40 and 50 billion dollars. Uh, Kappenman has done some calculations and has indicated that should the grid be knocked out for whatever reason, the economic cost to this country is something on the order of a trillion dollars a year. So an insurance policy, as was mentioned by uh, one of the earlier speakers, of 40 or 50 billion as a one-time investment is a pretty good idea. Typically, you can protect a substation for about 10% of the cost of a substation. If you're looking for a, an order of magnitude number of what does it cost to protect transformers or substations. Okay, let's now talk about one of my favorite topics, Mill 188-125, the very famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, uh, HEMP protection specification. The U.S. government recognized the cataclysmic nature of the EMP threat and our vulnerability to it. Extensive research evolved the methodology to provide some degree of protection to this threat. Those of you who have heard me speak in the past have heard me rail endlessly against this standard as being inadequate for the power, protection of the power grid. Recently, last six months or so, I've had some detailed conversations with people at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And we have come to an understanding, and I have come to a very important understanding. MIL 188-125 is specifically, solely, and exclusively designed to offer guidance on how to protect military communication systems, communication systems only, against high altitude nuclear EMP threats, okay? It is specifically designed to protect command and control functions. It is not designed to protect the power grid. A mistake that I and many other people have made is thinking that 188-125 is a recipe book for how to protect the grid. It offers little or no value and implementing many of its characteristics are, is a very, very dangerous path because it does not take into account the issue of non-nuclear EMP. And non-nuclear EMP is now where I will take this conversation. Non-nuclear EMP, well, those of you who may have seen uh, Ocean's Eleven, actually, I got a slide here for this one. Uh, hold on. Oh, here it is. This one. Okay, those of you who may have seen, anyone here see the movie Ocean's Eleven, George Clooney? All those people, okay. You may remember there was a wonderful scene where they have a van parked up on a, a mesa outside of uh, Las Vegas, and they got this really weird looking thing in the back of the truck, and they push a button and it blacks out Las Vegas. Well, what you saw there was theoretically correct, but visually the work of some absolutely outstanding prop men. This is a system that I built in 2006 uh, as part of a cooperative research and development agreement with the U.S. Army. Uh, which, when we tested it out at Picatinny Arsenal, produced 35,000 volts per meter uh, electric field, which is right smack dab in the, uh, the middle of the EMP energy spectrum. And more importantly, this particular device punched through the Army's best shielded chamber with only 2 dB of attenuation. Now that chamber was rated at 120 dB, which is, it's a logarithmic scale, so basically nothing should get out, and we got out with only a minor loss of power. Now, this is a real serious problem, because if I can build a system, this cost me about $20,000 to build. If I can build a system like this, so can anyone else who understands the basic underlying principles of physics. And you know, we went through one of the best Faraday cages around, like it wasn't even there. So let's talk about that for a minute, okay? The Faraday cage myth. 1836, Michael Faraday observed that a Faraday cage or a shielded box can operate by, to block an electrical field 
within the, uh, basically what he did was he built a, a box that was totally shielded electrically, all conductive, all soldered, all together. And he showed that the electric field uh, causes the electric charges within the walls to be distributed and they cancel the field effect with reference to the interior of the space. To demonstrate this, he built a room, allowed high voltage discharges from an electrostatic generator to strike the outside, and had an electroscope inside to show that there was no charge present. The MIL-188 depends strongly on this. When you've heard people today talk about, we'll have shielded this and shielded that, depends strongly on this. Unfortunately, Faraday was unaware of processes such as mirror image waves across boundaries, uh, the, uh, what is known as the evanescent field, uh, and also what is known a recent uh, phenomenon that has been discovered known as electromagnetically induced transparency, which is a quantum uh, electrical effect. And these all allow signals to pass through a Faraday shield. Even worse, there is something known as the inverse Faraday effect, where, and this is a direct quote, because uh, I wanted to make sure I got this definition right. A static magnetization is induced by an external oscillating electrical field at a given frequency, which can be achieved with a high intensity electromagnetic pulse. The induced magnetization is proportional to the vector product of the fields. Okay, so what this tells us is that you can create a pulse and it will go flying right through this shielded room or this shielded enclosure as if it wasn't there. Now, let's talk about stealth for a moment, okay? It's well known to the designers of stealth aircraft and other platforms that even the smallest aperture in a Faraday shield causes a breakdown in the shielding effect. There are some people who have been telling the power grid, the power industry, that you can shield your transformers by wrapping them in a Faraday shield. Well, aside from the fact that this is physically nearly impossible, um, this slide shows one of the biggest problems. This is a bushing on a 150 kV transformer uh, at my shop. The hole here is 16 inches in diameter. There's three of them. On the other side, there's three more holes that are eight inches in diameter. To make matters worse, there's a wire that runs right down the middle of this hole, which acts as an antenna and takes the signal that you're desperately trying to shield and conducts it right into the middle and happens to be attached to the transformer, which you're trying to protect. So if anyone tells you, you can wrap a transformer in a Faraday shield, they're full of it. And you can quote me on that. Okay. Uh, I, my notes here said shield acts as a piece of Swiss cheese, but I think you get the, the, uh, the, the picture. There are also other issues. The shields would have to be large, forgetting about this problem, uh, and there is virtually no space available in substations. Uh, they are packed as tightly together as they can be um, just by the nature of the design and the spacings between transformers and devices is governed by the National Electrical Code and ANSI and IEEE specs. So you'd have to rebuild all your substations to do this. Generally speaking, this is not a practical concept. Please, somebody tries to tell you they want to sell you a Faraday shield, tell them you'd rather buy the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, oh, and my last comment is other than that, it's a good idea. Um, varistors. My topic here is in, in italicized type. Varistors will save us. Well, as seen in the next view graph, okay, uh, this shows uh, essentially what we have. This black curve is, I'm sorry, the red curve is the classical e unclassified EMP waveform. The black curve is the, un I'm being motioned to the microphone. The black curve is the unclassified EMP waveform taken from the EMP Commission report. Uh, above it, you'll see a, re a jagged red line marked NNEMP. Uh, that is data that was taken from some tests that we did 
uh, with the U.S. Navy down at Pax River, where with a system that was not much larger than this table, uh, we generated 10 to the seventh volts per meter, as measured by the U.S. government. Um, this is a very distressing issue, and this is why, Chris, wherever you are out there, if you're still even here, uh, I know what the, the near-field problems are, and the near-field for this device extends out, it extended out way across the Chesapeake and into adjacent states, and we had to have coordination with uh, shipping and aircraft and satellites to just to run these tests because the pulse was so large. Now, over here, That line is the line that is the 20 nanosecond mark that MIL-188-125 uh, specifies and is what most varistors that are out there. Uh, there are some varistors that are a little faster than this, but most varistors are on, uh, have a rise time on that uh, level. So they're slow. They have a large voltage drop. When you run energy through them, because they are semiconductor devices, which as John Kappenman so delightfully put it, is like pushing electrons through a rock, uh, you have voltage drop, which causes them to get hot. When they get hot, their resistance changes and they draw more current, which causes them to get hotter. And there have actually been failures in large geographical areas of varista devices from low-level solar storms. Not even storms that are big enough to cause a major problem, but all of a sudden you just see, you know, in a 30, 50, 100 mile, you know, radius area, all the varistas are blowing out. Well, when John told me about this, I thought, well, you know, okay, interesting. So I spoke to uh, one of my consultants who is a licensed professional electrical engineer and a made world-class uh, forens electrical forensics expert and a specialist in transmission generation substation uh, systems. And he immediately knew about it. He's seen it in Connecticut. So I've got reports, reliable reports coming from Duluth and what is that, Minnesota? Wherever, wherever Duluth is. Uh, I've got reliable reports coming from Connecticut and from several other places that this is a possible phenomenon. Now, one of the problems is that when varistors blow, once you get to a point where they, you exceed their capacity, they blow out. They're like fuses. You've got to go out and replace them. And until you replace them, they are not there and offer you no protection. So that's the problem with varistors. Now, what are we doing about this? Uh, Advanced Fusion Systems has been engaged for the last four years in the construction of a world-class manufacturing and test facility designed specifically to build hardware solutions to enable high-efficiency protective devices and also vacuum-based uh, power control electronics. The plant, the plant uh, is 250,000 square feet. Uh, fully air conditioned, we can build electron tubes up to a million volts in capacity and capable of continuously supporting currents in the hundreds of thousands of amps. The tubes are thermally insensitive with an operating range without cooling or any external support of minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. We have an EMP test cell that we built that was built specifically for this issue. We recognize this as a pro the whole EMP issue as a problem. We recognize there are no good test cells and sort pl places to do this testing. So we went and built this room, which is 80 feet long. Huh. There's, my, there's the, uh, the one uh, typo per, uh, per presentation. It should be 80 feet long, not 80 feet high. Uh, it's 80 feet long, 40 feet wide, and 20 feet high. Uh, and we have in it and you can see the interior view on the right, uh, there is a 150 kV transmission line that hooks up to a pair of transformers that are mounted in there. And you can see my operations director, who is about 5'10", standing in the back to give you an idea of the scale. Um, 
the transformers have the Y connection in the secondary brought out as a fully insulated bushing so that we can address the issues of harmonics and GIC directly and in a simple form in the laboratory by merely hooking a power supply up to it without having to go through any great uh, exercise. And unlike the tests that were run last year at the Idaho National Laboratory, we're not afraid to blow these up. In fact, it is my intention to blow these up. And in fact, I actually have three of these, and some of you who have been to my shop have seen them, uh, so that I can blow one up and still keep working. Um, we also have done some work uh, on the area of harmonics, uh, recognizing how important it is. We have built extra instrumentation into the transformers specifically to measure harmonics in the primaries, uh, their delta primaries, so we put a CT in there for that. And we have de developed some interesting software um, that allows us to look at the signals coming off of the PTs and separate the, the even order harmonics from the odd order harmonics in software at the touch of a button on the screen. And this is a very important issue because the odd order harmonics tend to be uh, the damaging ones, and it's really important to be able to understand this. To our knowledge, we are the only people who have such capability. Uh, also, our grounding system is fully instrumented so we can actually see how these pulses dissipate out into the ground, because that's a very important issue. We have um, very state-of-the-art instrumentation. I could go on, but I think I've made my point. Uh, and I thank you for giving me this chunk of your time, uh, and I hope that uh, some of you take some of the advice I've given you. Thank you. <laughs>